And the scripture text that I'm about to read, that we're going to be looking at this morning, tells the story of the conversion of a Roman centurion, soldier in the Roman army, who had the privilege of experiencing the hidden work of God in his life. This story is it's kind of the big event for when the gospel begins to go beyond the early church, which was just in Jerusalem, mostly among the Jewish people. This story of Cornelius, the Roman centurion, is when that breaks out. And the gospel begins to go out to the Gentiles, the people who are not Jews. And more and more people come to believe in Jesus Christ. This is the story of the sheep that are not of this sheep pen that Jesus was talking about. This is when that begins to happen. Last week, we talked about Philip and the Ethiopian. And that was one man that was a Gentile who came to believe. But this is when it breaks out in full focus. So this story comes from the 10th chapter of Acts. And it's a long story. I'm just going to read the first eight verses. Because I want to focus on how in those eight verses we see the hidden work of God in Cornelius' life. So Luke tells us, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family, or all his house, were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. But one day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. He said, what is it, Lord? The angel answered, your prayers and your gift to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now, send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened, and he sent them to John. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Now, when I talk about the hidden work of God, what I'm talking about is the fact that God is already at work in people's lives before we ever get there. As Christians, we cannot make the mistake of thinking that we, we carry around God as a kind of possession, and that when we go present the gospel to people, that's the first time God has ever encountered them. As if God belonged to us, as if God were a commodity that we could peddle try to sell or give away. And the church has had to learn and relearn this over and over and over throughout history. There have been too many unfortunate cases of, of missionaries that go with, with wonderful intentions, but they assume that they are bringing God with them, and that's the first time God ever meets these new people. As if God had not already been at work in those people, maybe even in a different culture, even somehow through part of a different religion, God had been working on those people, getting them ready to hear the gospel. So that's what I mean by the hidden work of God. And this story of Cornelius clearly shows us how this work takes place and what it ends up leading to. Cornelius' life. First of all, the hidden work of God begins by God stirring up in people the, the natural hunger that they have for God. <coughs> you remember we did talk a little bit about this last week with Philip and the Ethiopian. This hunger is part of how we're created. We are not created whole beings. We were created hungry. We were put into a garden where there was food that we could eat. And taking care of that garden and eating of that food was, was a means of communion with God. 
course, when we grasped after the forbidden fruit, fruit that God told us not to eat, that was us deciding that we wanted to eat food for its own sake. That we wanted to satisfy our hunger without God being involved. Our spiritual hunger for communion with God goes hand in hand with our physical hunger for food. We are created hungry. <coughs> now Luke tells us that Cornelius is a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. And that he and his entire household were devout and God-fearing. That term, God-fearing, is a technical term that Luke is using on purpose. That, that term, God-fearing, refers to a Gentile, a non-Jew, who he lives rightly. He lives like he should be living if he were a Jew, but, but he hasn't been circumcised, he's not part of the Jewish family, he's still on the outside. A God-fearer is a kind of incomplete convert, who's on the outside, looking in, but nonetheless looking in with a great deal of interest. Cornelius is one of these God-fearers. He's, he's like a kid that's outside the window of the shop and he's got his face pressed against the glass. He's looking at what's going on inside. He wants to be part of what's going on inside. And so he prays regularly. He gives to the poor. He wants desperately to live like part of the family. Even if he doesn't actually have a seat at the table. He's hungry for God. And all of you are here this morning because of that same hunger. You're not here because you decided to join this family on your own initiative. This family of the people of God, the church. You're not here because you earned your way in, because you paid your dues. If God had not stirred up that hunger inside of us, we'd still be on the outside. God is the one who begins that work in us. And not just us, but other people who are still on the outside with their faces pressed against the glass. And maybe some who are just walking along the street and not even paying attention. God begins that work in our neighbors who are longing for a seat at God's table. Now, once God has first stirred up that hunger for him in a person's heart, God continues his hidden work by, second of all, revealing himself somehow to that person and inviting them into the family where they can hear the gospel message, where they can learn what being part of this family is all about. The story that we're looking at says that one day, at about three in the afternoon, Cornelius had a vision of an angel who said, Cornelius, your, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now you'll remember from a few chapters back, a few Sundays ago, when Peter and John healed the beggar at the temple gate, that three in the afternoon is the hour of prayer, one of the hours of prayer during the day. So this is when everybody, all the Jews pour into the temple and they're gathering for prayer. They're also gathering for sacrifice. This is when prayers and sacrifices are being offered at the temple. It's a daily ritual of praying and sacrificing to God. Cornelius is not there. He's not at the temple. He can't get into the temple. He's, he's a Gentile. Gentile. He's on the outside. So when the angel appears to him and says, your gifts and prayers have come up as a memorial offering before God, what the angel is really telling Cornelius is, God is receiving your worship as though you were offering it in the temple with the rest of the family. God has heard your prayers and seen your gifts and considered them as though they were a sacrifice, as though they were a memorial offering being offered in the temple before God. 
Your worship is being counted as though you're part of the family. That's what the angel is telling Cornelius. It's as if God saw Cornelius outside looking through the window and God stepped out and said, Cornelius, I've seen you looking through the window. Why don't you come in? Why don't you come in and I'll introduce you to some of the members of this family and they'll tell you what's going on here. They'll introduce you to this family. So once God has made a person hungry and invited them into the family, this is where the family, the church, the people of God, this is where we get involved. This is where the hidden work of God ceases to be a secret anymore. See, the angel tells Cornelius to send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who's called Peter. Well, meanwhile, in the story, if you read beyond what I read earlier, you see that Peter has his own vision. He has his own dream. He's hungry and he's waiting for the food to be prepared and he has this vision of a blanket full of animals being let down from heaven and, and God says to Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm a Jew, I'm clean, I don't eat these unclean animals. And then God says, don't call anything unclean that I have called clean. This happens three times and as soon as he wakes up from this, this vision, this dream, this trance that he's in, the men from Cornelius arrive at the house. They tell him what happened and they say, won't you come? Won't you come to our house, to our master's house? They don't know what's going to happen there. But if Peter had not had that dream, he would never have gone to the house. Gentiles are not supposed, or Jews are not supposed to set foot into a Gentile's home. It's unclean. But because of this vision, Peter was prepared and he went and he stepped inside the house of Cornelius and he has the chance to tell them about Jesus. And he watches as the Holy Spirit is poured out on the Gentiles, as the people, on the people that are on the outside. And he just watches in amazement as this happens. Now, as you read the story, you've got to ask, why didn't the angel that appeared to Cornelius, why didn't the angel just tell Cornelius the gospel? I mean, it's an angel, and he's going to believe what the angel says. Why doesn't the angel do it? Well, just as Cornelius is invited to join the family, the family is invited to receive this new member. See, as God's people, we are invited into the hidden work that God is doing, even right now before we ever know about it in people's lives that are on the outside. At some point, God invites us to be part of that. The hidden work of God is not just for the sake of unbelievers. It is for the sake of believers, of those who are already in the family, to show us the new thing that God is doing and to invite us to be part of it. At the same time God invites new people in, He invites the family out to see what He's been doing and to receive these new members of the faith. Now what all of this means is that we do not begin the work of evangelism, of bearing witness to the gospel. We don't start it. God is the one who is working in people's lives to bring them to know Christ. And this, this is the assumption under which we operate in everything that we do. We assume that God has been working in the life of every person that we see on the street, every person we think of in our minds. God has been at work in their life. We may not know how, but this is what God does. So before we ever start to do the evangelism, God's already there now. Every person is a potential believer in Christ. <coughs> We've all been created with this hunger for God, and every person we meet is either feeding on Christ or is starving to death. And it's our assumption that God is stirring up that hunger to bring them and us to a place where we can tell them more about Jesus as they come into the family. 
you know, this idea that, that everyone we meet is a potential believer made me think of something that you may have heard before. I'm going to bring up C.S. Lewis again. This is a sermon that he gave called The Weight of Glory. You can look it up online. You can find a PDF of it and just read it for free. And I encourage you to do that if you never have. But in this sermon, he reminds us to think more carefully about, about the fact that everyone's a potential believer, about the potential glory in each person that we meet. He says, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. You know, people who may enter the kingdom of heaven or not. It's a serious thing to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else, a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or another of these destinations. And it is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another. All of our friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. Every single person that we meet should make us ask, how has God been working in his or her life already before I even got here? And, and once we get there, how can I give them a taste? How can I give them some, some witness of, of that for which they are truly hungry? Of Christ. And as we go out to make Christ known, we have to remember that God was working there before we ever got there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.